Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to look at um, the banking system in a little bit more detail. More specifically, we're going to look at how banks uh, are involved in money creation and uh, affecting the money supply. So we're going to look at the role that banks play in the economy and we'll describe ways that banks create money. And we'll look specifically at what's known as the money multiplier and figure out how to calculate that number. And this information is in your book in Chapter 30 and the pages that are listed on the screen. Let's start with the idea that banks don't always lend everything that is deposited with them. Banks are financial intermediaries that uh, take money from savers and then transfer it to um, borrowers and through the course of loans. And, um, and so banks have all this money entrusted to them by their depositors and they send that out to, to borrowers in the form of loans, but they can't send everything out. One of the main reasons why, of course, is because people may come back and want to get their cash out of the bank. And so if people show up and all of the money has been lent out and there's nothing left in the bank, that's a major problem. So the banks leave some of their deposits uh, in the vaults in case folks want to get access to their money and the rest of it is shipped out in the form of loans. Um, so what that means is there are a couple of terms that we need to be familiar with. One is called reserves, which is simply the money kept by banks the money that they reserve for people to come and be able to get when they need it. The rest of it is sent out in the form of loans. The reserve ratio is the proportion of total deposits that the, the bank chooses to keep in its, uh, in its reserves. And so if um, for every dollar that's put in the bank, the bank lends out uh, 25% uh, of it or 75 cents and keeps 25 cents on every dollar, then its reserve ratio would be 25 cents. Um, so what the bank is actually keeping in reserves is our reserve ratio. The required reserve ratio is the minimum amount that must be kept in the bank at any one time and that's set by the Federal Reserve and right now it's at 10 percent. So for every dollar deposited in the bank, the bank is allowed to lend up to 90 cents of it and it has to keep at least 10 cents back. Anything that it leaves in the in reserves beyond 10 cents is what we call excess reserves. And so excess reserves are having the amount of money left in, in the bank vault that is greater than what is minimally required by the Federal Reserve. And some banks will keep excess reserves and some will not. One way that banks and businesses keep track of their assets and liabilities is through the use of what's known as a T account. And this T account helps us keep track of what's going on as money leaves the bank and comes into the bank. So assets, as you'll remember, are a claim on future income. And liabilities are a responsibility to pay somebody back in the future. So from a bank's perspective, the liabilities are their deposits because that's somebody else's money. So when people put deposits in the bank, the bank has to pay them back when they ask for it. Assets for the bank are loans and their reserves, anything above what they owe in form of the deposits. So loans are an asset because they have a claim on getting paid back by the people who pulled the money out. And then um, reserves are anything over and above the deposits that they, that they had placed in the bank. In this example, what we'd see is a bank that's in pretty good shape. They've got a million dollars worth of deposits, they have to keep 100000 in reserve uh, because of the 10% reserve ratio. And they've got loans of over a million um, or of a million dollars. And so the, the bank actually has um, more assets and it has liabilities, which is good news. Now, sometimes we have what's known as a bank run. And bank runs are very detrimental to the banking system. In a bank run, what happens is uh, people show up to the bank and want to pull out their money, which usually isn't a problem unless word starts getting around that the bank doesn't have enough money to pay people back. Because if the bank doesn't have enough money to pay pe everyone back, then uh, people begin to rush to the bank to try and withdraw their funds all at the same time, making sure that they get their money. Um, but when they do that, it ensures that people at the end of the line are going to be left with nothing. And so when there are rumors that the bank may be in trouble, you tend to see people rushing to the bank to try and get their money out before there's nothing left. 
This was a real problem back in the 20s and 30s, uh, particularly around the Depression. Today, it's not as big a deal. There are some things in place now, some regulations that help limit bank runs uh, in our system, one of which is deposit insurance. And we talked about this in class. The FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, guarantees that your deposits up to $250,000 will be paid to you if your bank fails. So there's no reason to run to the bank because you're going to get your money. There are also what are called capital requirements. Banks are required to have more assets to their name than just the loans and reserves that they have from the depositors. They have to take their profits and invest them and create more capital and more value for themselves so that they're not reliant entirely on depositors. And we have what's called the discount window. It's another alternative. The Federal Reserve, which is responsible for overseeing the banking system and which we'll talk about more in another day, um, offers banks overnight loans when they don't have enough money to cover their required reserves. And it's um, an opportunity then for banks to get access to money in order to pay back uh, depositors without having to shut down. Now when banks are busy making loans, they're busy creating money in quotes. I mean, the banks don't, don't print money, but by lending money, they, um, they're in the process of creating more um, claims on money throughout the, the system. So let's take a look and see what I mean by that. We know that M1 is equal to currency plus checking deposits. So anything that increases checking deposits will increase the amount of money, or M1, in our system. And the banking system helps generate increasing levels of checking deposits um, through the loan process. So let's take an example. $1,000 um, deposited at the bank. Let's assume that um, that initial $1,000 is deposited at Wells Fargo. In which case, the T account for Wells Fargo shows that there's no change in loans, but the reserves have increased by $1,000 but their, their uh, liabilities have also increased by that initial $1,000 deposit. And then let's pretend that uh, Marsha, who is a customer of Wells Fargo, shows up and borrows $900, takes out a $900 loan from the bank, because that's how much they can offer to her from that initial $1,000 deposit because of the reserve requirement. So in this case then, at Wells Fargo, they have a $900 asset They've lost $900 in reserves, and there's been no change to their liabilities at all. They still owe that initial $1,000 to the depositor. Well, we can pretend that Marsha takes that $900 and goes to Patrick's Patios and buys a nice patio set, spends $900 on it. When she does that, Patrick's going to deposit the $900 he receives from her at his bank, say Bank of America. And when Patrick does that, we see that at Bank of America, on their T account, there's no change in loans, but there is an increase in reserves of $900, but they also now have a new liability. They owe Patrick now $900 when he demands it because he just put down a $900 deposit. So with just doing two steps, what we see here is that that initial $1,000 deposit at, the, at uh, Wells Fargo has led to total liabilities in the banking system of $1,900. $1,000 from the initial deposit, and 900 for Patrick's um, that he received when he had uh, when he sold his patio furniture. So the thousand dollar deposit led to nineteen hundred dollars in total M1. So this should start beginning to sound a little familiar. It should sound a lot like the spending multiplier, where one person's spending became one person's income. This is very similar. One person's deposits becomes one person's loans, and one person's loan is their spending, which becomes another person's deposit, and it begins to um, roll down the hill like a snowball, just like that spending multiplier. And because it's like the spending multiplier, the good news is that calculating it is exactly the same way. The money multiplier uh, is, is exactly the same as the spending multiplier, it's just that we express it in a slightly different way. So we know that the spending multiplier is equal to 1 over 1 minus MPC, and we know that that 1 over 1 minus MPC is mathematically the same as saying 1 over the marginal propensity to save. 
And we also know that the marginal propensity to save in the banking industry is dictated by how much money has to be left in the bank's reserves when deposits are made. And that amount is the reserve ratio. So in essence, what we're saying is that the spending multiplier for individuals, which is one over MPS, is equal to the money multiplier for banks because the MPS for banks is their reserve ratio. And so we can take the money multiplier and rewrite it and say that the money multiplier is equal to 1 over the reserve ratio. So how much M1 is created is determined by the initial deposit times the multiplier. And the multiplier is based on the reserve ratio. So let's take a look at an example. Uh, if we pretend that we have a $1,000 deposit and the reserve ratio is 1%, then the banks are required to leave 10% in the reserves and they can loan out $990. The money multiplier then is 1 divided by the reserve ratio or 1 divided by 1% which turns out to be 100. So that $1,000 deposit will create um, an additional $99,000 worth of M1. The $990 in excess re reserves that can be lent times the $100 or $100 uh, money multiplier gives us that $99,000. And we could go through 5%, we could look at 10%, which is more common, and we'd say a 10% reserve ratios would be 100, the excess reserves would be 9,000, money multiplier is 1 over 10%, which is 10, which means then that um, that $1,000 deposit could create an additional $9,000 in M1, the $900 that was lent times the 10 multiplier. Now understand that what I've just told you is theoretical in nature only. It's not really that big a multiplier in real life, though we're going to pretend that it is for the purposes of our theory class. Really the money multiplier in today's world ought to be 10 with the reserve ratio, but really uh, economists assume it's a, or estimate that's about 1.6 or less. So the question is why? The money multiplier is not as big as it, quote, should be for a couple of reasons. One, because some people keep cash in their pockets. They don't actually spend everything, at least not right away. And probably more importantly, at least in today's economy, banks keep excess reserves. They don't actually all lend up to the actual reserve ratio, um, the, the, or the required reserve ratio. Uh, the real reserve ratio is probably above 10%, and as a result, then, the impact is less than um, theory tells us it ought to be. We'll spend some more time in class talking over these things, um, and uh, you'll get some time to practice on, on the problem set, and uh, I'll see you then. Bye.